Hi, I'm Mariana Restrepo, Deputy Editor of Buddha Dharma. I am joined here today by Sosan Miglioli, who's originally from Argentina, and he's the founding teacher of Sen Sin Fronteras, or Sen Without Borders, which is a global Spanish-speaking Sen Buddhist community committing to fostering deep personal transformation through Sen practice. Before dedicating himself fully to Sen Sin Fronteras, Sosan spent six years serving as Vice President and President of the San Francisco Sen Center. Sosan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Mariana. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd love to hear more about your journey. Can you tell us about your background and what led you to uh, Sen Buddhism? Yeah, well, I I started sitting Zazen meditation in Argentina, where I lived uh, before before coming here, about 20 years ago, more or less. Um, there and then, I was in advertising, so I, I had founded my advertising company in 1998 um, and had offices in, in Barcelona, in Spain, and Mexico City, in Argentina. Um, so I had that kind of life, you know, very stressful advertiser life. Um, because of that, at one point, um, I, I decided I wanted to... I wanted to do something um, about the stress, about the the, the difficulties I was having, um, more personal related to lack of connection. Maybe that's what I I'm seeing, you know, when when I see back. Um, so I started going to a, a sitting group of another lineage, a lineage from Taisen Deshimaru, the Shimaru lineage, who is a teacher from also the Soto Zen school, but uh, he traveled from Japan to France and established himself there. That grew, and the Shimaru lineage is probably one of the biggest in South America right now. So I started sitting in the Shimaru lineage um, as I was working as an advertiser. Um, and that was true for about 10 years. Hmm. Then in 2013, I got married again. Um, and my wife and me decided to go to San Francisco as part of our honeymoon. Mm. I I knew about Shunryu Suzuki Roshi and I had read Zen Mind and Beginner's Mind, the, 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 the whole thing. So, so, you know, I'm just going to San Francisco. I, I want to go and see the San Francisco Zen Center to see what, what all the fuss is about. So I did. I came to a public program on a Saturday morning. Um, and it was very different. What, what, what I was doing. Also, of course, Zen School of Zen, uh, Soto School of Zen. Um, yet the approach was very different to the Deshimaru approach. Um, mostly what I felt was um, something that Suzuki Roshi was very uh, keen about, which was this warm heart to warm heart feeling, um, a connection that was very close. People talk to you and there was something that had been happening for 60 years here in the US through the Suzuki Roshi lineage that was um, moved me, moved me deeply. So then I went back after my honeymoon and I said, well, is there anything here that resembles this? I couldn't find it. Um, I'm talking to teachers there, was, no, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different approach. I was very connected with this very humane approach. So every time I came back to Mexico for a meeting or something of my ad agency, I hopped on a plane and came to San Francisco. That was most of 2013 and part of 14. At one point I decided to do a ango, a practice period, a three month practice period here at the Beginner's Mind Temple in the city center in San Francisco. And that happened at second half of 2014. So I came here for three months. And I said, okay, so I'm going to go there for three months, deep immersion. I'm going to become Buddha. I'm going to go back to Argentina as Buddha and, you know, transform everything. I came here for three months. I think it was one month in and I said, oh my God, I, <laughs> I'm so far from Buddha. <laughs> I'm so not Buddha. So, um, so then in conversations with teachers here, I said, you know what, um, this, is, this is amazing. And, and I'm, I, 
I cannot practice this in my in my own language in Spanish, um, and and this this approach to practice I feel should be available for Spanish speakers. So then what you know? And as they say, twenty years of therapy doesn't make you a psychologist. So I said if, if I want to if I want to teach, I really need to prepare myself. I need to study. I need to ordain. Uh, and at that point. In conversations with Paula, with my wife, we said, "You know what? I'm I'm leaving my advertising company to people who are working with me. Um, I'll give them the keys, and I'll go to San Francisco to study at least for a couple of years." And I did. So before that, I had a planned trip to Japan for six months because I'm a Way of Tea student, a Chado student. So I went to deepen my studies of tea. My wife is an artist; she went to deepening her art studies there. So after six months in Japan, I came back and I went to Tassajara, which is a monastery in, in Big Sur of the San Francisco Zen Center. I spent there a year and a half, more or less, um, three and goes before coming back to the city center. So that in a nutshell was what happened um, in the beginning of my practice. I did my three and goes in Tassajara, came back. I started practicing and working here in the city center. At one point in 2018, the board of directors um, asked me if I would be the vice president, which I said yes to. And then after three years of that, I was asked if I would be the president, which I said yes to. And, and that was big. <laughs> that was a lot of work. Yes. And for Zen Center, it's a, it's a big entity, you know, it's, it's like the three big temples, Green Gulch and City Center and, and Tassajara. 180 residents. Um, it was a it was a big challenge and a beautiful one. I would do it all over again. Um, and of course, I learned a lot. It was a huge Dharma gate, huge Dharma gate. Well, that sounds like quite a journey. I mean, and I think you know to talk about you know the project that you're involved with, the one that you founded, Sense in Fronteras or Send Without Borders. It sounds that it was you know kind of your journey into Buddhism was to be able to also provide this kind of material and this approach to Spanish speaking uh, practitioners. So can you tell us about Sensei Fronteras and, you know, how, what was the inspiration behind it and how it came about? Yes, thank you. So that was the main reason I, I came here to study. You know, I, I felt that this particular um, approach or flavor of Zen, the Suzuki Roshi lineage, was something that was very, very meaningful to me, and that I wanted to to share at some point. And there, there was no groups Spanish anywhere in in Spain or in you know any, any, anywhere in the world. There was a small Spanish group here at city center in the, in the center of san francisco called zen in espanol it was called zen in espanol so i started leading that group a few of us it was six seven of us we met on thursday nights we meditated we read something we so and, and, and before that i was i was ordained as a priest so i was doing my my, my whole you know path as 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 become to become a teacher and at, at that point i started leading zen in espanol it was beautiful it was, small and beautiful but then COVID hit and when that happened we went online and what do you know when we went online it just started like growing and growing and growing people from all over the world joining for this I think I I'm a very um, I know media well in the sense that I've worked in advertising for many years I, I started a podcast called Palabras en el Camino um, and that grew a lot. And suddenly I have, I was, you know, having 250,000 followers in social media and, and, and all that also, you know, uh, many people came to Sense in Frontera to Sense Without Borders because of that as well. Right. I was, I was, um, teaching that, that way as well. At the same time, I was president of the Zen center. So, you know, um, I, 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 I didn't want to not do it and at the same time i couldn't really devote a lot of time to it 
because it was mostly on my or absolutely on my on my free time um but i started giving a, a dharma talk every saturday morning and we started doing zazen online and we started doing online intensives um so that that started started to grow during during covid just organically mm. right? um and honestly the silver lining of covid is it really changed the way we relate ourselves mm. in distance you know and it and it completely changed the way we study schools colleges universities it completely transformed the way we work mm -hmm. and i'm deeply convinced it did change the way we can practice mm -hmm. and really people from around the world like the the, the the critical mass of teachers that can actually speak spanish is very very is not there yet maybe at some point but um there's something about proximity before this that was a key component like if you don't have somebody teaching close to your house at least i would an hour commute away which is a lot you couldn't practice right, right. that completely changed and it and the potential felt so real to me that that's where sin without borders grow grew started right because i said you know this can and should be available regardless of where you live and um, and what time zone you're in. Of course, meeting in person is really important. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, you know, it, 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 I feel it's an and, not an or. So um, I just came back from Argentina. We had a meeting there. I'm going to Spain now in, in, in December. We're going to do a, a Rohatsu session there. So there is that thing of going deep in person once or twice a year, but then the continuity, the seeing each other every week, the groups that we form and people are meeting together, that, that's different, that's new. And that's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm having a number, big number of practice discussions one-on-one -on -one with, with students every week, mostly every day with, you know, this morning I had one with, someone in mexico this afternoon with someone in spain it's mind mind blowing yes <laughs> it's mind blowing so um so i was I, I was very clear with this that i came here to do this so when my term as president was coming to an end i talked here in the zen center said you know now it's now it's the time i've been here for 10 years in the san francisco zen center now is the time for this next step uh, in which um, I made Zen Without Borders a 501c3, a nonprofit corporation in the U.S. Um, and and after, or as from June 1st, that was my my first day as not as president of the Zen Center. I started devoting myself fully into developing this, that I feel can is can be and will be deeply transformational. Um, and and now I have all my energy put into this. Of course, resources and, you know, um, development and fundraising is not the same in, in, in Hispanic countries that is in the U.S., but still there's people in the U.S., both people who are Hispanics in the U.S. that support this or people who don't speak Spanish in the U.S. that want to support this. So so that's happening already. And, um, and what can I tell you, Marianne? I'm just blessed. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm so happy that this developed this way. One beautiful thing that happened was uh, the San Francisco Zen Center um, is really um, supporting this project, really supporting me, supporting this project, supporting Suzuki Roshi's way of practice, um, you know, getting close to more people from Spanish speakers around the world like what kind of you know core values or interests in the you know hispanic or latinx community do you think that can be addressed through buddhist practice and then the you know the other side of that is kind of like um what are any particular you know you know specifically soto zen practices that you really think resonate with the latinx community because you know as you said you know when you're telling us about your trajectory you used to practice a different lineage but then when you met with this lineage, like that really resonated with you. So why, you know, what was that that really resonated? Let's see. Buddhism in general, Zen as well, it's about dukkha, right? About suffering and the cessation of suffering. So that's that's kind of universal. 
there is one thing that I, I see that's different in my engagement with Hispanic uh, communities, um, which is our Christian upbringing. It's, it's a bit, you know, the Catholic thing. It's much more present than what I see in communities here in the U.S. mostly. I'm not generalizing, but mostly. So, so there's a lot of that. Most of us, including myself, come from Catholic upbringing and, and everything that that entails, right? Not, not judging at all. It's just different, and, and, but, it, but it does um, position oneself in a particular way as we approach Buddhism, uh, you know, where, where there is a non-theistic uh, religion or practice and there's no God and this and that, and then relationship with guilt or not, it's, it's very different. But in the core, we're talking about suffering, complexity, and the cessation of suffering. So people immediately connect with that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, the, the Soto school of Zen, and the way of meditation that we um, that we do, which is shikantaza, right? Just sitting. It doesn't mean that we or, or we do a sit. No, that's a wrong interpretation. Some people think that's the case, but it's not. It means that when you are sitting, all you do is sit. You don't work with koans. You don't work with mantras. You don't work with, you know sensations of the body you just sit it's a very hard way to sit actually you know just letting go of body and mind um and 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 that and that's a challenge and that's a challenge for for people um especially coming from people who maybe touched base with mindfulness with other things it's more guided that that's a challenge and yet there is so much space in in that you know, in just sitting, in just letting go, letting go. And what's interesting is it's not about making yourself more and more um, subtract yourself from where you're at, but it's it's more about including more, right? Mm -hmm. This it's an expansive meditation. You 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 include more instead of going going to a, a small 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 center. You know, just disappearing. It's not. It's including, include, include, include. So. So that's very that's very relevant. Having said that, the, the Suzuki Roshi lineage uh, and the San Francisco Zen Center lineage um, has developed a lot um, around interpersonal relationship mm -hmm. in practice, and the way the relationship between students, between students and teachers, um, the the friendliness, uh, the the warmness. That's all very, very important. So I see that within that approach, there is uh, a connection that happens that it, in some, you know, more, more maybe um, traditional kind of Zen, which is some kind of a more martial kind of Zen where, you know, that's a wall, sit facing the wall, let's talk in two years if you're still here. Yes, I was going to say it's interesting because, you know, Hispanic or Latinx communities are very much community oriented, family oriented. It's like, you know, that the aspect of like sharing and doing things as a community, as a family, right? And so some people, when they think of Zen, they might think of what you're describing, like something that is kind of very individualistic, very just like, I don't know, yeah, staring at the wall and like not, it, you know, the, the communal aspect is not very apparent. Um, so can you talk a little more about, you know, that community, you know, you were mentioning the human approach to the Soto Zen uh, practice? Absolutely. And, and and I'm not saying this is the only approach, right? And in the Soto Zen, and, and, and you can see, like, I, I go a lot uh, to a temple here in Japan town, Sokoji, um, and it's very much like a church you know there's this communal aspect and and it's very traditional soto zen right mm -hmm. but there's this families coming together and all these children i think a lot of zen the way we received it here was a more like the core stoic mm -hmm. kind of black robes sitting in front of a wall we don't talk to each other that much right and and what i what i what i see in these 
temples, city temples, urban temples, and the way they relate to community, to family, the way the San Francisco Zen Center has worked around that. It's, it's, it's not about letting go of tradition, you know, but once I heard something that I loved, which is tradition is tending the fire, not worshiping the ashes. Yeah. And I really like that. And so tradition is there. And as you say, you know, Latinx, and we tend to be very communal, very family oriented. And that's, that's an aspect that for me, it's a key Dharma gate. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's who we are and, and, and it's everywhere because I talk to people in Spain or Argentina or Uruguay or, or here in the US, that aspect, that communal aspect, that personal engagement is really alive. So it needs to be part of our practice, at least for me. And this is something that I bring as a value to Zen Sin Fronteras, Zen Without Borders, as a key aspect of our practice. So how has Zen Sin Fronteras, you know, supported this kind of community within, you know, Spanish-speaking practitioners? Well, there's one thing that I, I feel... So when we talk about a virtual community, um, for me now, after COVID, it's more like this is just a medium for connection as there are others, and it's just a community that right. connects sometimes virtually, sometimes in person, um, sometimes both. So, so it's just tools to connect, right? Um, we do do in-person meetings, as I'm saying, yes, to, to, to get together, to know each other, to deepen our practice, and then we have the availability, the continuity on the, on the online. So it's just about being connected all the time. And that's a part that the, the without borders part, right? The Sensi Fronteras part. How can we connect, be connected all the time? And right now, the way we change and the way we relate to each other after, after COVID, that's very true. You know, I, I, right now, I, I, the screen, I cannot see your legs, but it's big enough for me to see your heart. So, <laughs> so that, that's really true. Um, and then you get together in person. Oh, look, you're taller than I thought, or you're, you know. But then after that, people connect back online and already know each other, and there is some dynamic there going on. So I think it's it's about community. And then we have tools to engage and to deepen that community. Uh, the, the online tool being one, and the 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 idea here or the challenge here is how to keep being disruptive in this sense you know making use of everything that we have right now and all the technology and all the possibility of flying cheap here and there and and having the online thing and tools online and an app on the phone that will help you you know meditate or track your meditations i believe in all that i believe it can be disruptive and i can i believe it can really 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 support practice yeah. it's different i know dogen is probably in this grave saying, what's going on here? <laughs> Yet, you know, um, there, is, there is a big, big practice opportunity. And, and that's what we're doing. And, and that's how we're engaging as community, you know. Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, three treasures, three jewels. The, the three of them need to be very, very present um, for, for, for this to be true practice. Have you found that there's maybe differences when you're teaching uh, you know, an American audience versus a Spanish speaking audience, or are there practices that perhaps resonate more with one uh, community than another? And can you share some of those examples? Well, there, there's a number of things I could say, but um, so one is people in the US have a, have a lot of access, have a lot of access to like, it amazes me. You go anywhere and you pick up a stone and underneath there's a Zen group. You know? It's like, they're everywhere. It's that there's so many compared to other countries in the world. Um, and, that, and that in itself, and there's so many teachers, that in itself makes a big difference. People are much more, um, know much more about this and that it exists and maybe they went to a group or two. So, so usually when I start interacting with people around the world, Hispanics around the world, Hispanic speakers, they they have no idea what this is about. Mm. So that's, that's an important difference. And, and, you know, like written material, like I, I, I don't know how true this is, but I, I found something online about there being 5% of books, of, of Dharma books in Spanish 
compared to English. Right. right. So there's only five books in Spanish for every hundred books in English of the Dharma. That in itself is a huge difference when you're talking to different audiences. And then, and specifically in the US, I think um, I see a bit, more, a bit more pragmatism, maybe, you know, that comes from uh, the work culture in the US. It comes from maybe um, the, the, the Anglo aspect of things and, 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 People being, you know, more on the Protestant line or an Anglican line of 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 or upbringing, right? Uh, not so much on the Catholic part, and and that and that is a that is a difference, you know. Um, especially when it comes to ritual, and people being um, their their upbringing was in 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 Catholicism, you know, it's like this is the body of Christ. It's not, it doesn't represent, doesn't, this is the body of Christ. That takes a, a lot to believe, <laughs> right? So you start from there. Um, so yeah, there's some, some differences. Um, and mostly it's about the, 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 the religion, that's the main religion in, in each country, and in the US in particular, access. People have a lot of access here, which is wonderful. And we want to change that. And that's what we're doing, right? I'm curious to see what you think, you know, you know, when I think about, you know, growing up in Colombia and, you know, I also, you know, I also grew up Catholic and, you know, meeting Buddhism and, you know, so for me, it was like coming from a Catholic background and all these rituals and you go to mass and there's all these things happening and there's singing and chanting and bells and, and you know, incense and all the things. So for me, like Tibetan Buddhism was kind of like easier to go into because there was a lot of things that were kind of familiar in a way. And I remember when I started practicing Tibetan Buddhism, like, you know, like I like all the rituals, I like all the things. And I used to think like, wow, like these people who practice Zen or these people who go into a Vipassana retreat and like, don't do anything. They just sit there. Like, I was like, I can never do that. Like, I will go insane if I don't have something to do. But then, you know, things start to shift. And I was like, wow, that must be so liberating to like, not do, just sit, right? So have you found, you know, what was your, your personal experience with that and, you know, yeah, well, Zen is very ritualistic, right? Um, it's less colorful because, you know, as you know, Zen came from India to China, it became Chan in China, very influenced by Taoism and, and the whole Chinese, the, the, the Tao Te Ching and whatnot. Then it goes to Japan, it becomes Zen, it's influenced by the Japanese aesthetics. So that's, that's a lot of what you see. And yet, um, we have sometimes this idea of Zen that we imported from from asia that it's just sitting we don't do anything we're there in front of a wall and actually as, as i tell you it's very communal it's a lot about sitting and studying and talking and learning highly ritualistic as any other form of buddhism and you have all your ceremonies and i you perform weddings and and baptisms and funerals and so i think there's a there is a there's a gap um to what Zen is and, 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 and can be right now here, and it is in many places. And an idea of Zen of being very closed down and stoic and sitting and nobody's talking and that. And, and I, I don't see it that way. That was that was my 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 what moved me when I came here to the Zen Center at San Francisco. It was like, oh wait a minute, people are eating together and people are laughing together and people are you know practicing together in a way that's very very alive very humane and then and, and then i go to the to sokoji the japanese soto zen temple in, in in japan town and they're eating together and they're laughing together and they're even having a beer together and say whoa wait a minute so this is practice as well oh yeah of course okay but then when you sit you sit of course and then when you study you study of course and then we understand zen not as a book in your bookshelf, but as a bookshelf itself. Mm. And that changes everything because then everything is practice, everything is Zen. Mm. And that's great, I think. Yeah. And again, you know, shifting here a little bit again, what do you think the uh, Latinx community can contribute to a, you know the larger Buddhist landscape? Like what are things that as Latinos we can contribute to you know Buddhist practice, you know whether Zen or any you know any lineage. What do, you know? What do we bring to the table? Well, you know, um, 
you you talked about community you talked about the way we relate to each other how 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 close we are to each other how intimate we can get in, in you know in, in a good way and um and i think that's that's really important uh, the expression of practice of togetherness expression of practice of um taking care of um of being with others and practicing with others it's 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 a a huge thing that i feel we we have and we can and we can um we can offer um not that it's not happening in other of course it's happening everywhere but this is a specific thing that i think uh, the hispanic community has which is that warmth that that cohesion as a as a community that people who go to you know colombia or argentina or spain say oh but you know everybody gets together and they have so much fun and there's you know yeah yeah no, not better not worse just different and in the third you know treasure the treasure of sangha i think there's a lot that can be learned from from that so i, I really i really appreciate that and there is a lot to do right what you are doing what i'm doing all of us that are working towards growing fostering buddhism and in in, in hispanic communities it's really young. I feel sometimes like maybe what happened here in the late 60s or, you know, the big generation, we're kind of there. Um, right. And so there's a lot to do and, and that's fantastic. Yes, I mean, it's like we're at a point in Latin America that Buddhism is really exponentially growing. You know, 10 years ago, you couldn't, you know, like you said, you couldn't find a center, you know, within an hour commute, like you could, you know, and you didn't have that opportunity. And nowadays, I mean, it's not, it's not a, to the extent that it is in the States, but it is growing exponentially. And you can find, you know, not only a Zen center, but a Tibetan center, a Vipassana center, a Theravada center. Like you can find the different lineages, uh, you know, establishing and adapting and, you know, growing in Latin America, which is it's really great. And also, you know, in the United States, we have a lot of uh, Latino practitioners in the United States, which brings me to, you know, our, my last question is how could Buddhist teachers, you know, whether they're Latino or not, uh, and, you know, Buddhist communities and sanghas serve and support their Latino practitioners. What kind of things can they do to foster inclusion and engagement of the Latino practitioners in their communities? You know, you you used the key word there, which is teachers. One of the things that I feel um, it's important is, and this is just, you know, it just happens. Many, many people around the world, Latino and Hispanic communities, um, don't have teachers, so they self-regulate, and you know the the one who knows more is the one who's leading. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why there is dharma transmission, and there is you know everything. So, so I think we need to foster strong communities led by people who actually really prepare themselves for that. Mm -hmm. So, because then, if not, what what grows is not necessarily um, well balanced. And it can it can be more um, deceiving than a, than any other thing, you know. So it's important that there's more teachers to foster that, right? To keep keep making more teaching people keep studying, keep involving themselves, and they can be lay teachers or, or priests. They don't need to be just priests, you know. And I'm talking from um, on the Zen part. Um, when there there is, you know, we have one thing right now, which is I, I like to call Google Roshi. Right, and 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 that's 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 something that's not small. People are um, just self-educating themselves in whatever they find when they're tapping in Google, and that's a concern. So, as an answer to your question, how can we keep engaging people? How can we keep so um, so we need to keep preparing people to lead at at every different aspect or level or or or, or, or mo moment in practice. I think we need to keep creating leaders, Buddhist leaders, Tibetan Zen. We need to keep creating leaders that can lead others and help others and, and understand how to relate to dukkha and suffering in a way that's, um, that fosters awakening. So we, keep, we need to keep doing what we're doing, you know, and keep, keep um, providing spaces where people can devote uh, to their practice and keep deepening and some of those becoming leaders to 
to guide others. I think that's really important. Great. Thank you so, so, so much for speaking with us today. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah, and keep us updated with all the stuff with the Sense in Fronteras is a really wonderful project that I know is doing a lot of good to the Latina, you know, Spanish speaking community. So thank you for your work with that. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Marina. Thank you very much. And thank you for all that you are doing. You know, um, Buddha Dharma, Lions Roar, everything that's that's happening, that, that that's a key component of how we keep, you know, um, growing growing our our communities and 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 in 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 west and in depth so so thank you so so much and hopefully talk to you soon